reach out and touch the Lord as He passes by. You'll find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. Tonight, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of 1 Samuel. It follows Ruth, and uh, it's, uh, we're going to look at chapters 1 through 3, Samuel's beginning. Uh, in chapter 1, we're going to look at Samuel's birth, which is a very interesting birth. Uh, chapter 2, Samuel's uh, childhood ministry. And then in chapter 3, Samuel's call, a very powerful call. Uh, I uh, love to study Samuel. He is such a quality individual. Uh, I am sure he was imperfect, as we all are, but you're not going to see major sins in your uh, covering of him. You'll, you'll, there is one sin, I think, which we could attribute to him. We'll talk about that a little later, uh, a sin we're going to see tonight with Eli and really brought forth uh, in David and in so many believers and unbelievers, and that is lousy parenting skills. But uh, as far as being a man of God who loves God, he is a quality person. I can't think of more than a couple of people in the Old Testament who I think shine with the light that he does. Uh, Joseph is one that, that comes to mind. Um, certainly Samuel, certainly Daniel, uh, perhaps Jeremiah. But um, this man is just quality from start to finish. And it's a privilege to uh, look at his life and uh, we're going to tonight cover chapters 1 through 3, Samuel's beginning. So let's ask for God's help. Father, we're grateful for this chance to study your word as always. Help us to really, really understand it. And uh, help us to live quality lives the way Samuel did. Putting you first, last, and always. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Chapter 1, we're going to see Samuel, who is the author, is going to uh, give us uh, the transition uh, in the book of First Sam Samuel from Judges. We saw in the book of Judges, they were all doing what was right in their own eyes. And uh, they uh, had judges who led them into uh, the godly way of serving the Lord. And then they would go back into sin and be sorry when the judge died. Uh, and even when the judge was there, the leadership uh, uh, was such that they, they couldn't change hearts. It's, it's important to have godly leaders, but even if you have godly leaders, uh, we don't have too many of them in the country right now and probably never have had, but when you have godly leaders, that doesn't change every heart. The leadership is important, but it doesn't change individual hearts. The godliness is an individual matter. Uh, same in the home. You can have a godly parent or parents, but uh, that helps to have godly children, but doesn't guarantee it. Uh, we're going to see that with Samuel's life as well. But um, he's covering the uh, period here from uh, 1120 B.C. down to 971 B.C. Uh, it's over 3,000 years ago. And we're going to cover three characters uh, in First Samuel, three very important characters. Samuel, obviously. Uh, he's the very last judge, and he's the first prophet. Then we're going to see Saul, who becomes the first king. A real disappointment, to be sure. And then David, the king-elect. Uh, David, a man after God's heart, a very complicated man. And you're going to see that when you read the Psalms, you love David. You cannot lay a hand on him. And then you look at his life, and you have to say, God, you're God, thank God you are. I'm bad but am I as bad as David is? So David's a very, very interesting character. To me, he rises to the heights of godliness and sinks to the depths of depravity in his humanity as well. But don't lay a hand on him because God loves him and he is the ancestor of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we're going to see here the uh, sovereign hand of God as he takes Israel from total anarchy during the times of the judges to the line of David, 
the first, uh, the, the, the first godly king, but actually the second king of Israel after Saul. And of course, the ultimate king is going to be Jesus Christ himself in his reign in the millennium. And you and I are going to be here with him, aren't we? So the lesson, I think, for 1 Samuel is let God sovereignly lead you through Jesus Christ. So chapter 1 now, let's look at Samuel's birth, a very interesting birth. Uh, Samuel's going to talk about his mother's barrenness and her vow before the Lord, a very godly vow. Uh, he talks about his own birth and then his own dedication. And I think the lesson from chapter 1 might be, uh, using Samuel as our example, we should dedicate our children to the Lord. Children's dedication really comes from this story of Samuel. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jerom the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, and they were from the tribe of Ephraim. He was an Ephraimite. He had two wives. Yeah, there's a formula. Every man's dream, right? Well, <laughs> where do you see how that all works out? He uh, had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. Hannah had children, but Hannah had no children. Well, right off the bat, you can see problems, can't you? One is being very fruitful and the other one is not. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Now Shiloh was the location of the tabernacle in the early days of Israel. And so every year he goes up to worship. He's a godly man. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord were there. So Eli is the high priest. He has these two sons who are just terrible. Hophni and Phinehas, and whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. So he would give portions to sacrifice of, of meat to God, part of the ritual of worshiping the Lord, animal sacrifices, blood. Blood had to be shed for the forgiveness of sins, looking forward to the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ for our sins. So he gave portions to Peninnah, but to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. So he had a stronger love for her than for Peninnah. Reminds us of Jacob, who had a stronger love for Rachel than for Leah. And um, so it is, if one were to have two wives, <laughs> I guess you would love one more than the other, uh, perhaps. Uh, it's tough when parents love one child more than another. We don't like to admit it, we'll never admit it. Uh, but with children and grandchildren, if you get to know families well enough, you're going to find out that there's probably a favorite. And if you ask any kid who was the favorite, they'll tell you somebody else was. I like to say my mother's favorite was my brother Casey. He denied it, she denied it, but in heaven we'll find out that I was right all along. But uh, anyway, this is part of growing up. And if you weren't the favorite, so God loves you and you're his favorite. Amen? Well, now uh, she got a double portion, but her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So Penina is really getting on Hannah, making her life miserable. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. I wonder where Elkanah was during all this time because his wife Hannah is weeping. Why are you weeping? Does he get involved or does he look the other way? Who knows? But there's this rivalry going on and it's not good. It was never God's plan, by the way, to have two wives, three wives. Uh, that's man's plan. Um, God had the plan of Adam and Eve. But we're going to see this is a common uh, situation. Wait, wait till you see David, who's going to have eight wives and a couple of concubines, followed by Solomon, who's going to have 700 wives and uh, 300 concubines. And oh, the trouble that comes through that. Well, We've got family tension here. Verse 8, Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So that's the solution right there, right? <laughs> I'm better than all your sons. So he, he does inquire, but I don't think he's got much of a listening heart at this point. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. And uh, Hannah's going to do the right thing. She's going to go to the one that can help. The husband can't help. 
but she knows to go to God. She's smarter than we are sometimes. Go to the one who can help. I'm unhappy, I'm miserable, I'm going to complain and get on Facebook and tell my friends how horrible my life is because they're going to change everything for me, right? Well, when people say, how are you? My advice is say, I'm just fine. I'm just fine because start to complain. They can't help you anyway. Go to the one who can help you. Go to God. So Hannah arose and she finished eating and drinking and Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Oh, she wants that child. Then she made a vow and she said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him or lend him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. So she puts it right out there. She says, God, give me a child. Give me a male child and I will give him to you or I'll lend him to you and I will take the Nazarite vow for him that no razor is going to come upon his head. He is not going to, we saw that already with our friend uh, Samson, didn't we? Until her, his head was cut. The strength, of course, was not in the hair, but in the vow. And so uh, she made that vow to him. And uh, look what happens. Verse 12. It happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. So the priest is watching her mouth and her mouth is moving, but no words are coming out. So Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard, and Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. So he's being presumptuous, as we often are. Maybe she was speaking in tongues, who knows what, at that point. But Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked or a woman or a daughter of Belial, a daughter of Satan. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. So she's in that position that you might be in as well, and nobody really understands her. Hannah doesn't. She goes and she tells the problem to her husband, no doubt. He doesn't understand. Hey, you want a son? I'm better than 10 sons. So that, that's a pretty, pretty uh, sorrowful response from him. And then here's the priest. And he says, what are you, drunk? Knock it off. So sometimes nobody understands the sorrows. And what's that old uh, spiritual? Nobody knows the troubles I've known. Nobody knows what's going on in your heart. Go to the one who understands. Go to the one who really cares, and that's the Lord. So Eli answered and said, all right, he's satisfied now. Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman, woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. She was no longer sad when just a few verses back she was weeping bitterly. Look at verse 10. She was in bitterness of soul, prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Now verse 18. She goes her way, she eats, and her face is no longer sad. What has happened? Nothing has happened except prayer to God. And prayer to God changes everything. This is faith, and this is how faith operates. No, I'm going to be bitter, I'm going to weep, I'm going to be in anguish until I see the things change. That's not faith. Faith is going from bitterness to prayer to laying it on the altar, giving it to God, and going about your business, wiping your face, eating, and no longer being sad. Faith trusts God even before there's evidence of anything changing. So here's a woman of great faith, to be sure. Verse 19. Then they arose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. I love that. We see that uh, he uses that expression for Noah when they're in the ark and elsewhere in the Bible as well. Lord, remember me. That's a good prayer to pray for somebody else. Somebody is in anguish. Somebody is hurting. Lord, remember that person. Lord, of course, he doesn't forget them, but it's a, an idea for us to say he's once again turning his favor and grace upon that individual. Verse 20. So it came to pass in the process of time 
that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, really literally means heard by God, saying, because I have asked for him from the Lord. So she acknowledges in that name that God has heard her and has answered her prayer. That's why you'll find the name of, uh, of Samuel is very common uh, among Jews. Uh, usually it's pronounced Shmuel, but uh, we say Samuel, and uh, it means heard by God. Now the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. So next year they go back up again. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, not until the child is weaned. Then I will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. So she's not going to go up that year until Samuel is weaned. Weaning in those days would be typically two to three years of age. Today, unfortunately, for various reasons, uh, often it's much, much less time. But uh, she would have taken the full amount of time for the welfare and the health of the child. And I think for that motherly instinct to hold on to him every moment that she can. So Elkanah, her husband, said to her, do what seems best to you. That's the smartest thing he said so far, right? Wait until you have weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. Again, that's also smart. Let the Lord establish or confirm his word. When you're trying to make a decision, when you're trying to decide what the best course of conduct is, perhaps with your spouse, perhaps with others, Lord, confirm your will and your way. Establish your word in our lives. So the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. Now when she had weaned him, verse 24, she took him up with her with three bulls, one ephah of flour, a skin of wine, brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. How old is he now? Three? Four? Not much more. Then they slaughtered a bull, brought the child to Eli, and she said, O oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore I also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshipped the Lord there. So we find her good to her word. and God was good to his word. God has brought forth this very special child, and she has weaned him. Now, we talk about dedication, and we have dedication services here, as many do, uh, but the parents take the child out the door at the end of the service. We're not equipped to do a daycare service uh, full-time here. Well, in this case, she's going to leave the child there. She will not take him back. What a hard thing that was for her to do. But she was grateful to God for what he had done, and she was ready now to fulfill her end of it. They worship the Lord. And Hannah now, chapter 2, is going to uh, pray. And she said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven, and she has many children, has become feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man shall prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went to his house at Ramah, but the child ministered to the Lord before Eli the priest. What a prayer. I thought Hannah was a godly woman. 
I have no idea how deeply she understood the Lord. These are the kinds of prayers that you hear from Mary, from Elizabeth, and from some of the great men of God in the Bible. Let's go back to verse 1. This woman knows God. My heart rejoices in the Lord. She's not rejoicing in her circumstances, not even saying she's rejoicing in the child. She certainly is, but the real rejoicing comes in the Lord. You get that child that you want to have and praise God. That's what a joy it is. But don't ever make that child God because there'll be a sad conclusion to that scenario. Make the Lord the one in whom you rejoice. My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn or my strength is exalted in the Lord. So our joy comes from him. Our strength comes from him. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. She understood that God is the one who brings deliverance or salvation and healing in every aspect of our lives. No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Ah, that rock. That rock will be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus in the New Testament. Upon this rock, he'll say to Peter, I'll build my church. What rock? The rock that it's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. You want knowledge? You go to God. He's the one who will give you that wisdom, that understanding. And by him actions are weighed. Weigh my actions, Lord. Are they pleasing to you? We don't always know. We do things we're supposed to do. We go to the hospitals, we visit people, we minister the word, etc. Is our heart pure? Only God knows. Weigh my actions, Lord, and purify them. That's what he's going to do in heaven. When we get up to heaven, he's going to take all those actions and words and he's going to put them through fire to see what's pure and what's not. Burn out what is not of God and keep the rest. Verse 4, the bows of the mighty men are broken and those who stumbled are girded with strength. So God's able to take those who are mighty and powerful in their own eyes and bring them down. And he's able to take the ones who are weak and humble and build them back up again. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread. Oh, they're full of themselves. They've made their money in the world. and They end up being poor. Poor here on earth, maybe. Poor in heaven, they won't even get there. The hungry have ceased to hunger. Those who are hungry in their hearts for the Lord. He's going to take care of their needs. Those who reach out for the Lord's help, he's going to minister. Even the barren has borne seven, even as Hannah has borne Samuel. She who has many children has become feeble. So again, God's going to be the one who strengthens us and makes us fruitful. Verse 6, the Lord kills, he makes alive. He brings down to the grave and he brings up. Oh, she's, he's talking about bringing up from the grave. What does she know about that? That's prophetic, isn't it? It's going to be Jesus Christ who's going to be raised from the grave. It's going to be the believers in Christ who are going to be raised from the grave in the great resurrection. And even in the Old Testament, those who die in faith will be raised from the grave. The Lord makes poor and he makes rich. He brings low, he lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust, lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. Again, being very prophetic, looking to the future. Ephesians 2 talks about that throne of glory. Revelation 4 talks about that throne of glory, the throne of Almighty God. And so she's got a vision here of taking way, way down into the future. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. He'll guard your feet. Wherever you go, he'll make sure you do not stumble. For by strength, no man shall prevail. You can't prevail by your own strength. Many try. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven, he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. They're looking forward to the great Lord Jesus in the millennium, judging the world, the, great, the white throne judgment, judging all those who've rejected him, the throne of judgment in heaven, judging the saints. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. King, there is no king. There is no king. This child, this three or four year old child will anoint a king in the future. But there is no king. She's talking prophetically here about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
he'll be the king, and you'll be a horn of the Lord's going to be exalted. Then Elkanah, of course, goes back to uh, Rama, and the child is left behind, this little fellow, and he begins to serve the Lord, serve the Lord by serving Eli the priest. What do you do with a three or four year old? Let him follow you around and learn what to do. And that little fellow begins to handle the elements, begins to handle the bread when it's brought out on the seventh day, begins to handle uh, the, the, uh, the wine uh, as far as the uh, cup. He doesn't drink it himself probably. But the Lord is going to use this little fella even at the age of four, five years of age. He begins to serve God. So with your own children, it's never too soon to have them serve the Lord. Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. Verse 12, they were sons of Belial. The sons of Eli were really the sons of the devil. They did not know the Lord. Here they are. They're going to be the, uh, one of them is going to become the high priest uh, through ordinary passage of time because it goes from father to son, the eldest son. And here they don't know the Lord. How many in ministry don't know the Lord? How sad that is. I remember when I uh, was asked to speak at one of the most prominent churches in this area. The pastor uh, was not the one that invited me, but his wife did. Uh, she uh, had become born again with us and tongue-talking, spirit-filled. And she uh, pleaded with her husband to have me speak to their Friday night uh, adult group. And so reluctantly he called me in and said, what do you think is salvation. And I said, salvation is when you give your heart to Christ and he cleanses you from your sins and you have new birth in him. And I said, what is your definition of salvation, sir? And this is the church that I had grown up in so many years before. Great denominational church, one of the most prominent ones in the area. This man was the head of the council of churches and all sorts of things. He said, salvation to me is being committed to membership in this church and carrying out the good works that this church does. So I thought well, he and I were just miles apart on what salvation was. But uh, he said, uh, go on ahead anyway. I thought I'd get them all saved. I ministered to the Lord before the 30 or 40 people here. I thought if there were stones, I would be stoned to death. They despised verbally a born-again Christian, anybody who would be saying salvations by the blood of Christ. So uh, <laughs> that was quite the time, to be sure. Um, they didn't know the Lord. Eventually, this man did come to Christ. Years later, after his wife died, I had the report that this man had given his heart to Christ and humbled himself before the Lord. He was much older at that time, had served the Lord at least 40, 50 years, but finally came to know the Lord. So it's never too late. Don't give up on anybody. Don't give up on anybody. Verse 13, the priest's custom with people was, and here's the evidence of how corrupt they were, that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling. So they're boiling the sacrifice, and they, these, these boys send their servant with a big meat hook to just grab the best part of the meat for themselves. He would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. The priest would take for himself all that the flesh hook brought up, so they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. And before they burned the fat, the priest's servants would come and say to the man who sacrificed, give meat for roasting to the priest, for he will not take boiled meat from you, but raw. I don't want boiled meat. I want to barbecue it, just the way I like it, medium rare. And if the man said to him, they should really burn the fat first, that's what God had said, right? Give me the fat. Then you take as much as your heart desires. He would then answer, no, but you must give it now. I want it with the fat. I want what I want right now. And if not, I will take it by force. So here's ministry imposing itself on the people, fleecing the sheep instead of feeding the sheep. And how many ministers have done that? Uh, it's sad to say. Therefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. That's what happens when you steal money from a congregation, you take the best for yourself, let the congregation serve you instead of serving them. They're going to hate the ministry, perhaps hate the Lord. How many have turned from the Lord because of the example of wicked people in leadership? But Samuel, uh, that word but, but Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as a child, wearing a linen ephod. He had that, little, that, that robe on that his mother would make for him, and he was unlike the sons of Eli. This little fellow was pretty much as pure of heart as you can find. 
Moreover, his mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Can you imagine spending that whole year making that robe? Was that a labor of love? Oh, she loved to do that. I wonder how big he is now. I wonder if he's grown it up. Let's put an extra inch on the sleeve leg. I'll bet that robe could be another inch or two longer here. Oh, I can't wait to see him. I'll see him only for a day or two and I'll hug him. Oh, it's going to be so hard to see him go. But I made a promise to God, and God is using him. You talk about a sacrificial heart. She certainly had it. So Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, The Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was given to the Lord. Then they would go to their own home. So Eli's blessing them. She has given her child to us. Lord, give her more children. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. I love that expression, grew before the Lord. Lord, may my children, may my grandchildren grow before you, in your presence, under your blessing. Now Eli was very old. Verse 22, he heard everything his sons did to all Israel, how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. They had sex with the women in the congregation right at the door of the tabernacle. So he said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil doings from all the people. No, my sons, for it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father, because the Lord desired to kill them. So we find here weak parenting, but also God's going to use that weak parenting to bring about what he wants. He wants those boys put out of business. Uh, They're not going to inherit the leadership, the priesthood there. Uh, But this is weak parenting on his part, his wife's part. And uh, this reprimand, this rebuke is not very severe here, is it? Uh, You're going to see that he's just, you know, why are you doing this? And... uh, it's like he's kind of beating them with a wet noodle, right? <laughs> so uh, it's, it's hard to, uh, to parent. I've never had that uh, opportunity and, uh, or that skill, but to parent and to parent with love, but also with a strong hand of discipline when necessary. The Bible talks about that in Proverbs. And uh, our friend uh, uh, who writes uh, uh, Proverbs is going to have much to say about that. And uh, Solomon is going to, You have some very strong words, and even David probably has some influence there, about disciplining your children. It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to do it. David's not going to discipline his kids, and Solomon won't even know their names. He will not discipline his kids either. So uh, follow what I say, not what I do. So verse 26, the child Samuel grew in stature and in favor both with the Lord and men. There's a prayer for your child, for your grandchild. Let them grow in favor with both the Lord and with men. When a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies are at peace with him. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not clearly reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense and to wear an ephod before me? Did I not give the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? So he's saying to Eli, this man of God's got some courage. He says to Eli, in Egypt, I called your father, meaning your ancestor, uh, Moses' brother, and uh, he, Aaron was the first priest. Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling place, and honor your sons more than me, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people? He's blaming Eli for the work of his sons. He, the, these boys are not respecting me. They're taking my sacrifices and taking the best for themselves instead of for me. They're stealing from me. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now, the Lord says, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. I've changed my mind. 
Behold, the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house, so there will not be an old man in your house. I'm going to cut off your strength. None of your offspring are going to live to old age, to the full ripeness of years. And you will see an enemy in my dwelling place, despite all the good which God does for Israel, and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. But any of your men whom I do not cut off from my altar shall consume your eyes and grieve your heart, and all the descendants of your house shall die in the flower of their age. Wow. What a price he has to pay because he didn't train up his boys to honor and serve the Lord. Now this shall be a sign to you that you'll come upon your two sons on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. Then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. I will build him a sure house and he shall walk before my, me, my anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left in your house will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and say, please put me in one of the priestly positions that I may eat a piece of bread. I can't even get a job out there. Make me a priest and let me have something left over from the table of showbread. So God's got someone in mind. Samuel is going to certainly be one example of who he has in mind. King David will be another example. But the ultimate example is Jesus Christ. I have someone who will be faithful to me forever. Now chapter 3, we see Samuel's call. God is about to call. Uh, uh, chapter 2, before we leave chapter 2, look at your lesson there. How many mothers' prayers support their children's ministries? Uh, this woman, do you think that uh, she forgot about Samuel once she took him up there to serve in the house? Or did she pray for him every single day? What do you think? I'm sure she prayed for him every single day. Uh, it's, it's A.J. Bernard has a very powerful ministry in New York, and he tells the story about his mother. When he was uh, beginning in his ministry, small and struggling, his mother was on her knees every single day. His church has become one of the largest churches in the country, and um, he has uh, just thousands of people there and a huge network of volunteers and, and paid staff. And... Uh, his mother came to him um, not so long ago, and she said, Honey, when you were young, I used to get on my knees and pray for you, but um, now I'm getting old, and uh, it's too painful for me. My knees are wearing out. You know what he said to his mother? Mom, get knee pads. Mom, get knee pads. He wouldn't let her off the hook. And uh, as far as I know, if she's still alive, she's still praying. A.J. Bernard, interesting ministry. Check it out in New York City. In any event... Uh, so, uh, mom, get knee pads. <laughs> Samuel's first prophecy, chapter 3. Now the boy ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. Not many folks heard from God. Why? Not many wanted to hear from God. And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see... And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, remember he's right in the tabernacle, where the table of showbread is and the altar of incense, and the lampstand offers the light before it goes out, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel said, here I am. He's just a little boy now. And suddenly he hears this voice, Samuel. He says, here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call, lie down again. And he went and lay down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. He answered, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. So he had been spending this time ministering to God, but did not have that real personal relationship with God. That speaks to us of many of our lives. I, I served the Lord for a long time, for many, many years, from age 13 to 26 in particular, reading the Bible every day, had, an off, had a position of ministry to others, did not really know the Lord personally until it was appointed unto me to receive him. Well, the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you did call me. 
And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. So this is now going to be the calling of him. Perhaps you have people in your family who you have taken to church, you've read the Bible too, maybe they read the Bible as well. Maybe they've joined you in prayer, but the light just hasn't gone on. You're not really in a personal relationship with him. Don't give up. Just continue to minister, continue to love them, and pray for that time when the calling of God comes upon their lives. And the light bulb goes on, and suddenly they know him and are born again. Don't ever give up. Verse 9, Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. Remember what that prophet had said? And now it's confirmation. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and he did not restrain them. Notice that he did not restrain them. And therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel lay down until morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel. I'm sure Samuel thought, oh, I hope the old man forgot about uh, my hearing from God last night. No, he didn't. So Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, here I am. And he said, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. And I'm sure little Samuel's heart was beating like a drum. So Samuel told him everything and he had nothing from him. And he said, this is Eli speaking, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. So that's the best thing to do when you're going to have to go to the woodshed. When there's going to be punishment, you better say the Lord uh, uh, should do what's good to him. So Samuel grew. The Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. So he becomes powerful in the Lord. He speaks, and those words are directly from God. All Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, north to south, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. So here he is, the young man has now become a prophet. He's the first real resident prophet that we see in the scriptures. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So we're off to a very interesting start with one of the great men of God, Samuel. Um, Chapter 3 talks about that call on his life. Can you remember the call on your life? Do you remember that time that God called you? Maybe it was one time in particular. Maybe it was just over a gradual period of time. And uh, never despise that. It's a wonderful opportunity to remember that calling. And maybe sometimes the calling gets a little bit dim. And we begin to think, I'm just not feeling the fire anymore. Lord, help me to experience that calling again. Renew that calling in my life, Lord. And you go to God and you call on him and say, Lord, renew within me that heart to serve you. So Samuel is a a great man of God, a wonderful mother who dedicated him. For mothers and fathers, place your children on the altar, dedicate them to the Lord. Go to your local church and say to the staff there, I want to dedicate this child to God. If they were baptized as infants, while it's not biblical, it was well-intentioned in some ways, it doesn't make any difference. Get those kids dedicated. Get them put on the altar before God. Ask that church to stand behind you and help you to raise those children to love the Lord. And you've tried to do the best you can and the kids are not serving God, don't give up. God perhaps hasn't called them at this point. Pray that he will and pray that they'll be hearing his voice and mused mightily. And uh, for yourself, just stay, stay close to him. Samuel never veers from the Lord. He never wanes. He never fails, never has any real open sin. He'll have the same problem as, as Eli and King David and Solomon and so many parents. He'll be soft with his kids and his kids will not be faithful like him. 
But uh, you be faithful. Do the best you can to raise godly kids and grandkids, and God will take care of the rest. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Father, we're grateful for this study, and we're excited about this book and how it's going to be showing us the highs and the lows, the good and the bad, uh, and the ugly. And we're going to see uh, the good through Samuel. We're going to see the, the good through young David. We're going to see the ugly in Saul. And to help us to draw lessons for our lives, most of all, Lord, help us to be faithful to you, to serve you, and to hear your voice as you call us. Call us, Lord, into salvation. Call us into working with Jesus to do that which you've called us to do. Lord, come into our hearts. Live your life in us. We'll live for you and we will serve you and help us to take that good news around the world through prayer and every opportunity available to us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Moment your needs to sound.